I'm going to let you know when we're streaming live to Facebook. All right, we are now streaming live. Uh, pursuant to recently adopted amendments to the Illinois Open Meetings Act, included in Public Act 101-0640, public bodies may, in certain circumstances, hold entirely virtual public meetings without a quorum physically present in any one location. Governor Pritzker's Executive Order 2021-23 has extended this provision through October 16th, 2021. As chair of the Finance Committee, I have made the determination that it is not practical nor prudent to meet in person at this time. Accordingly, this meeting of the Finance Committee is being conducted virtually with members participating through the Zoom webinar platform. Village Manager Corrali is in the Village Hall Conference Room as required by the Open Meetings Act. Phil, can we have a roll call, please? Certainly. Trustee Vree. Here. Trustee Hallwax. Here. Trustee Rubin. Here. We have a quorum. In accordance with the supplemental rule, the board approved on April 16th, 2020, here's how public comment will be taken at this meeting. The email address and telephone number designated for public comment for this meeting were published with the meeting agenda. In a moment, I'll ask Jordan Lester to read the public comments that were submitted prior to the meeting. If anyone would like to submit a public comment during the meeting, please email your comment to glencomeeting at villageofglencoe.org. Comments submitted during the meeting may be read at the end of the meeting. Written comments should be limited to 400 words. Jordan, are there any public comments that we got before the meeting? No, we did not receive any. All right, thanks. Uh, on that, um, we need a motion to approve the minutes from our last meeting. So moved. Second. Uh, do we roll call or just all in favor? We got to roll call it, okay. yeah. Trustee Vree? Yes. Trustee Hallwax? Yes. Trustee Rubin? Yes. All right. All right. Um, now, uh, monthly reports. Nikki. Okay, a little rusty. Thank you, Trustee Bree. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Oops. There we go. Okay, so on tonight's agenda is um, the August Treasurer's Report. We will be providing CIP updates as usual, and then we're going to go through some of the financial forecast assumptions, which you may remember, this is just kind of the initial forecast um, assumptions of what we are thinking before we do the full financial forecast in October. A uh, few highlights from the general fund. Uh, overall, very good news. Um, we are two thirds of the way through the year and our revenue performance continues to be strong. Um, on the property tax end, we are seeing receipts lower than prior year, but we do start to see these, we are starting to see these come in in September um, and October due to the Cook County um, extension of the property tax due date. Um, we are starting to see income tax or continuing to see income tax and sales taxes at unusually high levels. Um, no complaints here, but we are um, cautiously optimistic about this. Um, so we are still really watching our expenditure levels um, despite the strong revenue performance. Um, our places for eating tax is really kind of our star performer here at 162% of budget. Um, we're receiving revenue um, much higher amounts than what we had originally anticipated um, back when these revenue projections were developed. It was still kind of in the midst of, of COVID um, and we weren't sure how that was going to go, but our community has continued to support our local restaurants, which has been phenomenal. Have you gotten any anecdotal news about how restaurants are doing relative to what they might normally do? I mean, is this above, call it normal environments, non-COVID normal environments, or is it sort of like normal? Um, that, I mean, is, is this, is the 72 just way under budgeting because we thought that COVID was gonna continue to have an effect and we just didn't understand it, or are we getting a better year than we might expect? Nikki, I can jump in on that. I, I think we're probably seeing um, better performance than we than than some of the restaurants would have um, anticipated in the past. Um, we're not necessarily sure why that is, aside from the fact that there is a a um, 
a general interest in downtown Glencoe uh, that perhaps has not been quite at the level that it is uh, recently. And um, in my, again, anecdotal conversations with some of the restaurants, I do think there are some aspects of their uh, business that have not returned to normal, indoor dining being um, primary among those, but they've seen a real surge in curbside pickup and um, obviously outdoor dining that that um, is still underway and exists. So um, I think everyone is pleasantly surprised that things are going very well um, overall, but whether it's, it's going to be, these are, these are numbers that we should be anticipating at all times. I think we're gonna need a couple of years of data before we have a better sense of uh, exactly what to expect. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. And I do think the estimate was probably a little low because I think we were really anticipating it not to be a normal year. So yeah. uh, probably a combination. Okay. Um, water fund revenue continues to perform strong um, with the drought, um, the dry weather that we've had this summer. We're starting to see um, some very high water bills come in. Um, we've been pushing out information to residents on water conservation um, and educating folks on use of irrigation system. Um, obviously the revenue is great for the water fund, but we also um, have kind of that responsibility to, to understand um, water conservation as well. Um, so Nikki, can overall, I jump in real sure. quick on that too? One point to make is that our water meters that are virtually 100% completely uh, deployed in the community are providing really, really helpful information to us as we are taking calls from residents who are surprised by some of their water bills. Um, we have been communicating publicly in our social media and e-news blasts over the last couple of weeks that if you're running your irrigation system every night, you can be using anywhere from five to 8,000 gallons of water um, to, to do that. And um, when we put that to dollars and cents and we say that could be you know, 45 to $70 a night in water, people are like, oh, I had no idea that we were using that much water and we're pointing directly to the, to the usage on those meters. We can, we can pull that up in real time. Um, and my, my hope is that um, in early 2022, early to mid 2022, we'll be able to launch the, um, uh, the portal, the online portal that'll allow people to check their, uh, their usage um, themselves without having to call us. Um, but it's definitely proven to be an invaluable source of, of data um, for us as we're having those conversations with residents. Thank you. Okay, and just a few notes on cash flow projections. As I mentioned earlier, sales tax continues to be received in amounts that are higher than prior years. Um, we are, on the contrary, starting to see this is the first month we've seen use tax dip a little. Um, so you may remember from earlier reports, the state of Illinois did change um, the distribution methodology with some online sales. Uh, so we were anticipating seeing an increase in sales taxes and a dip in use taxes. So now that we're starting to see a slight dip in use taxes, we may want to start charting these out parallel to each other so that we can truly see the year over year change. Um, but again, this is just the first month that we are starting to see it. Nothing to be concerned about because sales taxes are still performing very strong, um, but that may be part of the reason that's contributing to that. Um, we did receive the American Recovery Act installment. So this is the first installment of two that the village will receive. So that was actually, I'm jumping forward to September, but we did receive it in September. Um, and that dollar amount was just under $600,000 at $599,921. 
That amount was deposited into the water fund. So you'll see that in the September financial report. Um, understanding that earlier this year, the Finance Committee had conversations about using those funds towards water infrastructure. So that will sit in the water fund until those projects are identified. Um, and then lastly, just the projected impact for the year, um, bottom line on the general fund, we're still projecting that we'll receive about $400,000 over um, budgeted revenue in the general fund. Um, so this will decrease the amount of money that we were planning to draw down the general fund this year for capital. Um, and really the drivers of this positive impact um, are the one time drawdown that we did earlier this year from our insurance pool um, and then also just strong revenue performance. Um, so overall, very good performance um, so far in the general fund and the water fund this year. Um, and we will continue to monitor this um, and hope that this will continue. Are there any other questions on the treasurer's report? One question, Hoover yeah. state permit revenue, has that started yet much or is it nothing much? It has not. We are still awaiting um, uh, commencement of that project. And I would anticipate because of the, the staging and the, the timeline that goes along with that project where they're, they're actually installing a lot of the public utilities first um, and the public infrastructure first, it's probably likely that we're not gonna see any residential permit revenue till the middle part of next year. Good question. The, um, the funds that we just received the first installment of, can any of those funds uh, be allocated to the repair work on the pipes under the lagoons that we're going to be doing? Those are water. Yes, is the simple answer to that question. And as we'll be talking more about that in October when we bring a contract to the board, um, but that's a, that is a good question and, and the answer is yes. Thank you. Good question. Okay, so moving on, I'm going to hand it over to Stella to give the golf course update. Thank you, Nikki. Well, the positive reports continue. August was another good month for the golf course. We did have 1,300 rounds over budget. Uh, right now, we are 5,000 rounds over last year and 9,000 over our year-to-date budget. Uh, if we do hit our budgeted numbers for September, October, November, our grand total for the year will be 42,500 rounds this year, which would exceed last year's numbers and break another record for us. Um, so we're in the midst of another very good year. Uh, we did have a play for pink event at the golf club. So this is uh, an event that we hosted with our ladies league to raise money for breast cancer research. And we raised $4,200 um, for that. So we were pretty proud of that. Uh, Friends of the Glencoe Golf Club update. Uh, right now we have $24,484 in our account. Uh, we did get our $125,000 anonymous matching gift, which we talked about briefly last month. Uh, we had a board meeting today and we are looking for ways to create some different giving levels to kind of push our board to, to reaching that matching gift sooner than later, because we have a due sense of an urgency as the end of the calendar year is the due date on that. Uh, one other thing to note, part of that anonymous gift is they are also funding a campaign director for friends. Uh, this would be an independent contractor, not an employee, and this person would work directly with myself and the Friends Board to drive the fundraising efforts as we are in our last month with our contract with Campbell and Company. Uh, so we are receiving resumes right now and, and looking forward to getting this new person uh, to help us out to keep the momentum going with the fundraising. And we're going to have a more comp, uh, com, complete conversation relative to golf club fundraising at the Committee of the Whole on Thursday night. Yes. Any questions thus far? 
Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Um, okay, so now I'm going to hand it over to Linda to go over the CIP update. Good evening, everyone. Um, just wanted to highlight some of the updates on the community investment program. They're shaded in blue. Um, a couple items to note is at the September meeting, um, they will be presenting a contract for the downtown gateway and wayfinding signage for not to exceed $107,715. Um, the other items to note are, you'll notice the blue items basically are changing the timing of the projects. Uh, some of the projects have been delayed. Um, you'll notice that the vehicles are now going to be expected in November. That's due to production delays. Um, in addition, some of the projects have been deferred to um, next year. 2022, um, those are due to staffing considerations. Um, one of them, the safe routes, has been delayed due to IDOT um, delays. Nikki, you may want to advance. There you go. Uh, the only other point that I'd make, in addition to what uh, Linda already reported, as a reminder, the downtown gateway and wayfinding signage that is uh, being funded with excess resources, uh, bond resources from the Tudor Court uh, streetscape improvement. Um, and those uh, that, that investment was anticipated with that uh, bond issue. Are there any questions? Um, I had one question. Um, I note that in our estimates in the CIP, we've got the safety, uh, excuse me, the, the driving range safety netting. Uh, it's been in there at about three and a quarter. And I think in the materials that we got, we're now estimating that project. And maybe it's because it's combined with others at about half a million. Um, if anybody can speak to that. Stella. I can. The um, that is a direct relation to an increase in the cost of materials, unfortunately. Okay. Hey, any other questions? Seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you, Linda. Okay. Okay, so our last item on the agenda is the financial forecast assumptions. Um, so just a quick review, um, each year we do a five-year financial forecast um, based off of um, what we are looking at in terms of the budget um, and capital investments over the next five years. Um, so this year's forecast will run from 2022 through 2026. Um, and generally the assumptions are based upon several critical factors, including current economic conditions, um, the village financial policies that we talked about earlier this year. And then the best information that we have available to us today as far as state and federal regulations, anything that's changing and that could impact the underlying budget. On the revenue side, um, we do know that property taxes are expected to rise about 1.4% in 2022. That is the allowable increase under the PTEL extension limit. Um, we are also aware that there may be an increase uh, or an ability to recover um, property tax revenue from um, homeowners that had protested their taxes. Um, right, now the, right now those taxes are just deducted from the distributions um, that the village receives. So that was a recent change this year and what we can expect going forward. Um, so that's a positive for us as far as property tax revenue goes. The, on the water side, um, we are proposing a slight adjustment um, from the rate study. Uh, we had talked about this earlier this year, understanding that we have more accurate measurement of 
the water that's flowing through meters um, now. So we are starting to see um, also an increase in consumption because of drought conditions. So that's fared fairly well for the water fund. Um, we don't want to go too low on a water increase because we do want to make sure that we still have enough um, reserves to both support any debt that we need to issue in the future for infrastructure and also support operations. Um, so tentatively, what's included in the assumptions right now would be a six and a half percent rise next year. Uh, we may be able to adjust that as we start to finalize our CIP recommendations. So I do expect to have a more comprehensive conversation with the committee next month um, when we have those capital um, items finalized. Similarly with sewer fees, we are proposing increases to support capital improvements. Right now there's a placeholder of about 3% per year in the forecast. Um, again, that can change depending on where we fall with CIP recommendations to the committee. Um, building permit revenue, Chair Vri, you were um, talking about this earlier. We do have some placeholders in there for um, Hoover Estate construction starting next year um, and understanding that several of those homes will likely be constructed and permitted each year thereafter. Um, and then we also have some projections for state shared revenues based off of the latest information that we have from the Illinois Municipal League um, on income tax, use tax, MFT, and personal property replacement tax. And just a quick note on PPRT, um, IML is still kind of ringing the bell that we may see a dip in that revenue. Um, we have yet to see that this year, fortunately, um, but that is something that we will continue to watch. On the expenditure side, um, as we just saw with the golf netting, we are seeing contractual and commodity costs rising. We're seeing delays um, in supply chain due to disruptions in shipping, um, supply shortages. So that's kind of baked into the forecast as well. Um, we did put placeholders in pen for pension costs um, in accordance with the new policy that we discussed at length earlier this year. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the capital line is still under evaluation. So we're hoping to have a, a more comprehensive recommendation for you next month. On the personnel side, um, we have some question marks here. Um, the salaries that are included in the forecast includes personal costs for all full-time and part-time seasonal employees, um, but we do have some collective bargaining agreements that are expiring. So those are still under negotiation. Um, so the cost of living adjustment for those and any financial impact would be pending. So we certainly would put a placeholder in the budget um, to account for what we may think may happen, um, but that may be um, still under development at the time of the budget is, is recommended. Um, the forecast also includes an attrition factor associated with staffing reductions and, and staffing changes. Um, we've done that in the past. It's a very small percentage, understanding that the village will evaluate that every year. Um, and then over time, obviously is subject to seasonal events and vacancies. We do have several vacancies right now, um, particularly in the public safety department that'll drive those overtime costs up in the near term. Okay, um, included in the forecast memo, there are three tables uh, similar to what we have done in previous years. I won't go through all of these, but I'll just highlight a couple of them. Um, the first table is based off of iterative iterative assumptions, um, anecdotally, what we are kind of keeping in our eye on that could have an impact on the budget and on the village finances going forward. Uh, first and foremost, I would be remiss if I did not mention the COVID-19 pandemic. Although our revenues have remained steady, um, we do know that additional impacts may still be possible. So that is something that we have to continue to be diligent about. Um, Supply chain shortages, as I just mentioned, um, that's been kind of a significant impact already. We're looking at um, some vehicles that may take up to 22 months um, from the time of ordering to be delivered, um, if they can be delivered at all. So um, that is something that we are definitely feeling locally already. 
um, the impacts of inf any potential inflation. It's unknown at this time whether we will see that or not. There's certainly differing opinions out there in the market of whether or not we're going to see a spike in inf inflation or if that will remain steady. Um, let's see. And then lastly, um, the other item that I wanted to highlight was the American Recovery Act funding, um, which is obviously a little bit of a game changer for our water fund, especially in the near term. I'd only add real quickly, um, we are still, I think, in an environment to speak to Nikki's point relative to the pandemic on the market around us, especially our hyper, hyper local market with our downtown and um, our other sales tax generators, our, our three car dealerships, not really knowing what the short and long-term impacts are gonna be. Certainly, if you drive past our two new car dealerships, you will see very few new cars sitting on the lots. Um, we're seeing and hearing that that new car shortage, which is being driven essentially by a shortage in microchips, um, is going to last well into 2022. Uh, the question of whether used car sales are going to make up the difference um, for some of those new car sales that are going to slow is a, is a question that we don't have an answer to yet, but certainly um, we're seeing an uptick uh, in used car sales overall um, in the market. And as we continue to see our downtown um, uh, remain uh, kind of enlivened. Um, we have a brand new restaurant that's just opened this month. Um, there are some conversations still about possible future restaurants in, in the downtown. Writers Theater is reopening to in-person performances in December, and they have a full season scheduled uh, that will include four shows that will run through the end of July. So um, we, we are seeing kind of bits and pieces of the, of the evolving um, environment around us continue to be a little bit disjointed, not really sure how long some things are gonna last, other things are gonna last, but uh, we're definitely keeping our eye on it. And the value of these regular monthly check-ins with the, with the committee is that we were able to talk through it and, and kind of understand what, what our numbers are looking like as we go through that. But looking into a forecast um, model, it, it may be complicated to predict some of those changes that may be on the horizon. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to table two, the major revenue assumptions. Um, as I mentioned, the property taxes we do know will be increasing um, by 1.4%. Um, the out years here um, in the forecast, these are um, the CBO forecast for CPI um, going forward. So we're using that um, as a base for our projections moving forward. Um, sales taxes, we're trying to temper out. That's going to be difficult to predict for a while um, until we see this real, this true impact with use tax. But you'll see that kind of going steady, slightly increasing and the use tax on the contrary is kind of decreasing based off of that new legislation. Um, on a utility tax, um, we are projecting that to go up slightly. Again, that's going to be a little bit difficult to predict um, the impact of the new green legislation, if that's going to impact that tax. Um, certainly will impact us on the expenditure side. So we will see um, higher utility costs likely going forward. Um, also, as we mentioned on the building permit side, we are assuming uh, several homes, 22, from 22 to 25 um, related to that Hoover estate development. Um, that certainly could change depending on um, the trajectory of that development as well. We are seeing telecommunications tax decline. That has been the case for several years now. Uh, so that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Um, so I don't, I don't expect to see anything crazy change there. And then one other note, we will have our final receipt of Rebuild Illinois funds in calendar year 22. Um, those items or those revenues are earmarked for streets. Um, so that will be aggregated and um, utilized towards a comprehensive road program recommendation as part of the CIP. 
parking fees are going to be very difficult to predict for a while. I don't think anyone was anticipating an 85% drop um, in parking fees this year. So this will all depend on how quickly commuters will return to the office um, and if they will at all. Um, so that might be that might be slightly aggressive, but we'll have to watch that going forward. Um, on the locally controlled revenue side, um, this is what we were kind of referring to earlier on the water revenue. Uh, this line shows kind of what we're anticipating. It'll be weather dependent. It could be adjusted based off of what we bring forward in terms of CIP next month. Um, but then for your reference, this was the original rate increase schedule that was in the water rate study. Uh, so slightly kind of bringing these nearer years down, smoothing that out um, over time, trying to make sure that we still have the revenue that we need to um, fund all of the capital improvements that need to be done. And obviously on the fixed side, those rates would mimic whatever we do on the volumetric side. Um, on the garbage services fee, this is the garbage collections fee that covers the cost of just the garbage collection process. Um, those are all projected forward using CPI. That's similar to what um, our current provider does with their fee structure as well. Um, let's see. And then lastly, just to note on this slide, vehicle licenses are assumed to be stable rates uh, throughout the forecast as well. On the expenditure side, we talked a little bit about salaries earlier. There's just a lot of um, calculations that go into the salary side of things. The projection moving forward is based off of a combination of CPI, attrition, um, what we think will happen in staffing levels over the next five years, um, as well as what we anticipate will happen with the collective bargaining agreement. One thing real quick, if I can jump in here, Nikki, um, this is, this is going to be a hard one. Um, we're starting to see uh, collective bargaining agreements settling at rates significantly above these. Um, and to Nikki's point before, nobody's really sure what's happening with inflation yet. Um, so this may be a moving target, uh, but for the moment, we're going to stick with, with the, the factors that we have uh, available to us. Um, but I would just caution that as we work through this, even as we work through the budget process, uh, over the next three or so months, um, these these numbers in the forecast may prove to be difficult to to rely upon. Thank you. Um, as I noted earlier, with the police pension, um, I've slotted in the recommended contributions that were included in the model. Um, if you remember from last year, these numbers are significantly tempered from where they've been in the past. Um, so we are hopeful that we continue to have strong market, market performance. Um, consolidation is well underway. Um, on the fire side, they're quite a bit further along than the police side. They've scheduled their first tranche. Um, of investment funds for consolidation starting in October. Um, so they will have several tranches um, moving groups of funds at a time um, each month. And then police is, I think, tentatively anticipating that starting early next year. So um, we will likely see our investment fees increase before they decrease, um, just the cost of transitioning and um, reconfiguring the portfolio uh, based off of the new guidelines with the consolidated fund. Um, but we are hoping to see um, better investment returns just because the makeup of the fund will be different. Um, the securities that the consolidated board will be allowed to invest in are different than what would be allowed at the local level. Um, so we're hoping that strong investment performance will positively impact our contribution levels as well. So that'll be a long run, long term game, but definitely something that um, will hopefully help us in the long run. 
Um, on the debt service side, um, I have some placeholders in here with possible issues in 24, 26. That's using the CIP unadjusted. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're still working on those capital recommendations and along with that capital recommendation will come a financing plan. Um, so we will slot debt payments into these out years based off of um, what we're recommending as well. Um, and then as, you know, not to kill a dead horse, the capital items, just there's a placeholder there. <laughs> um, in terms of next steps, the full financial forecast will be coming before we before you in October. Um, obviously, if you have any feedback or any thoughts for us this evening that you'd like us to incorporate, be happy to do that. Um, and then we will also be rolling in the CIP recommendations so you can see the whole picture together and what that would look like going forward into the next five years. So at this point, I'm happy to answer any questions or take any feedback that you have on what we've prepared so far. I think the only thing that I, I looked at it, the, the building permits line, um, does anybody have an idea what average the average age of the homes in town is now after we've gone through so much construction over the last few years? Rusty Bree, we're actually, it's a, it's a really good question. We're going to be talking a bit on Thursday night with um, the Historic Preservation Commission. Peter Van Vechten is the chair. He's going to be giving a presentation to talk a bit about that. I think they have um, in their research determined that about a quarter of the village's uh, housing stock has turned over since 1990. Um, so we're three quarters of the housing stock is is in various ranges. It's hard to say with with absolute certainty, but um, how much turnover? We've seen relatively new homes be torn down um, and replaced, and we've seen some of our older, obviously older stock that's been torn down and replaced. Um, and Jordan, you may be able to speak more to this than I, because I know you're your liaison to that commission. Do they have more spe specifics than what I've already articulated? Uh, thanks, Manager Crowley. You're you're right. You're foreshadowing what the commission will be discussing with the board on Thursday. Um, they break it down a little bit more, particularly in terms of percentages um, by certain neighborhoods. Um, but I can't. I don't have a good estimate at the top of my head of a, an average age of the homes. Stay tuned, though, Trustee Vree. We'll have more information on that. Okay, because the one the one question I would have is that those numbers looked possibly a little low if um, we do have sort of the normal amount of turnover in in houses plus the 29 that are getting built um, from the Hoover. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's a good point. Yeah, we'll take a look at that. I think the other thing that's driving building permits lately is renovations have been pretty significant, um, not just new, not just new homes. Um, so there's generally a pretty significant level of investment going on community wide. Yeah. Okay, we'll review those. And just a comment. Um, I mean, it seems like we're flush everywhere. <laughs> And some of it is from federal intervention, um, where I, you know there may come a day where we have to pay for all of this, uh, and so I don't know what what that means. But just the the everything. I mean, we go through COVID, and our finances are better than they were before we went in, um, and that's maybe that's untenable. I don't know, uh, or not not accurate, whatever. Um, so that's that's just a comment. It just seems like things are financially a little little too good, um, and that we ought to be prepared for some of those periods that are that are not going to be quite so good. Yeah, I think that's our concern too. Um, as we as we talk through this, and Nikki and I were talking about that this morning. You know, as we emerge from this, and and I'm not really sure what that means yet because um, the pandemic itself. Is, is certainly kind of going through waves here. Um, but there are areas where, where we, have, we have performed exceptionally well. Um, 
sales tax and, and places for eating tax being just two of those areas. And how sustainable is that um, as the economy shifts and changes? Um, it's, a, it's a concern for us. I don't think we want to walk out of this saying, hey, everything's going to be fine. I don't think that's our perspective, nor is it yours. I think some, some cautious optimism um, in some areas and some um, cautious pessimism, frankly, in some areas is going to is going to be important as we work through this budget in the coming few years. Uh, the next two budgets after this, I would say. And, and so, just last comment for me. Um, you, you touched on it, but inflation. Uh, I mean, right now, all the talk is that these inflation readings are, are transitory and not not more durable. Uh, and so if we start to see three, four, five percent for a few years, as opposed to just a couple of quarters, um, what might that mean? And how do we how do we prepare for it? Because that would also be a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if we start to see the wage inflation ticking at three and a half percent or four even potentially. Uh, so if we have capital goods and wages, that gets tough. <laughs> Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, to, just to, you know, with all this unrestrained, restrained glee, uh, I, I know the village manager has been talking to me about the fact that we're about to have to spend a boatload of money on um, the water pipes that are going uh, under the lagoons and the expressway. So we have expenditures. Definitely. Yeah, I think the other piece of all of this is we don't know the the ARPA funds that we're receiving this year and next were not expected. Um, And I don't think we want to consider that that's going to be a repeating opportunity for us. There continues to be a lot of discussion about a federal infrastructure program. Um, a trillion dollars worth was was approved. We don't know whether that is going to uh, find its way to us directly or indirectly. Um, that's an aspect that that continues to be a bit of a question mark. And you know, there there this this conversation about federal spending on infrastructure extends past what has already been uh, approved. Uh, we, we, I think, are going to take a very cautious approach um, toward getting our hopes up on anything related to that. I think we will continue to, to be mindful of the, um, the need for bond referenda in the relatively near future and you know, what that means to our overall tax base. Um, I do want to underscore Nikki's point on water rates. I know when we were talking about those ARPA funds and and funneling that $1.2 million that we're expecting into the water fund, the idea was to try, if possible, to limit rate expansion. Um, I I think that's that's certainly something we're going to continue to do some work on um, so that as we approach a budget, we want to be mindful of um, you know where where we're impacting our residents and you know how we can utilize those resources to limit future impacts on our residents, knowing that we still have somewhere in the neighborhood of probably fifteen or sixteen million dollars in in um, water distribution infrastructure. Uh, I will say we're probably. Um, with the investments that we're going to have to make in our uh, water main, our transmission main that that exists under the Skokie Lagoons, that's likely going to delay the need to do something with our water tower for a period of time, which is a good thing from the standpoint of what the water fund is going to have to support. That, if you remember, is a five plus million dollar placeholder in our 10-year CIP. And if we're able to defer that out several years because we now have uh, the the necessity of replacing a a water main that we had hoped we weren't going to have to, that actually slows the need for some of those water revenues. So we're, this is an iterative process, obviously with um, 
everything that we've been working through this past uh, 18 months with the pandemic and some of our staffing uh, issues that we've worked through over the past three or so months, we are going to um, need to take kind of get nose to the grindstone on this stuff. But that's what you can anticipate uh, more conversation on in October, November and December as we work through the draft budget uh, that you'll start to see uh, in in real paper um, uh, about a month from now. You know, one follow on is we've been talking about inflation or inflationary factors. Uh, if they ever actually do get dollars pushed out to whichever governmental entities in terms of a massive infrastructure spending program, uh, the effect on that isn't going to be to reduce any of our capital costs going forward. It's not, no. And we're, you know, I think we're just going to continue to see a significant, <clears throat> you know, we're already seeing a significant increase due to COVID related factors and otherwise, uh, and, and the follow on from those things. Um, and it's all the other spending is just going to make it, you know, better in the sense a lot of infrastructure will get done. It'll be great for the country as a whole. Yay, that's true and I, uh, that's great. But in terms of our own micro view of what's it going to cost the village to do things we have to do, mm -hmm. it's going to be more than we're probably currently thinking it will cost us. I mean, just the golf course netting <laughs> project. Now that may be an extreme example, but terms of percentage increase over an estimate that isn't that old, but we're, it's going to be expensive. And that's just a guess. Yeah. Is what all these things are going to be. I, I agree. Trustee Rubin, the other, the other factor that is going to come into play is the ability to even do certain projects. Um, the struggle we're already seeing, and we're seeing this with vehicles as, as Nikki mentioned before, you know, we got we got some orders in early this fiscal year. Um, we're hoping that those deliveries are still going to be made this fiscal year. But I was talking to my some of my colleagues in surrounding communities that have put in orders for identical vehicles um, just in the last few months, and they're now being told there's a, a lead time of 20 to 22 months. So the 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 what does that mean from a budgetary perspective? It means that we may place an order, but we may not budget for that to receive that for a couple of years. And let's hope that the number stays relatively within the same threshold of what we expected. We're also going to see a, a, uh, an increase in the price of professional services. So engineering, um, and, and other design components of our capital infrastructure needs, I have a feeling we're gonna see those, those numbers start to go up if we can get contracts at all, because if you see a significant rise in federal spending on massive infrastructure uh, projects throughout the country, that's going to sap the engineering resources of the entire nation as well. And so this is, this is a very unusual time. And I think it makes for much more complicated forecasting than anything we've really experienced in the last decade or two. Um, really probably since the, the, the Great Recession at the end of the 20, uh, the, the first decade of the 20th, 21st century. So I think you're right, absolutely. Everything that we think we know, we're going to have to be willing to adjust and um, and take another look at as we're sitting down and and making some assumptions about how these projects, what these projects are going to look like. Wouldn't we also assume, Phil, that the center is going to not have labor and ability to get things done? I mean, yeah. at some point, you know, I think we, we've all come to the, con I think we've all, we're all realizing that this has, you know, as, as Trustee Brees had been unprecedented. And um, as you've commented several times, there's a lack of predictability, but I, I would challenge the notion that we're going to be able to get things done that we want to get done and should be thinking about what are the must-haves versus the things that 
can absolutely be put off and then be securing the contracts to actually get the the, the workers, mm-hmm. not beyond even the vehicles. I, I'm 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 concerned about you know the, you know, the labor personally. Yeah, you took it a step further from what I was saying relative to the design and, and engineering teams that kind of are the first phase of some of these big projects that we know we need to do. But then when the rubber hits the road and it's time to start digging in the ground, will there be adequate construction resources available to us as well? I think it's going to it's going to be an interesting few years because if we start to look at that, um, one of the issues that came up back in 2009, 2010, right after the Great Recession was was kind of taking hold and the federal government started um, uh, pouring resources into capital investments at the time, was that you found that sometimes you had to actually partner off with other communities to try to aggregate projects together so that they would be attractive enough for uh, contractors to actually bid on some of these projects. And that is, I think, going to be something that we're, we're probably going to have to look at again, except it's going to be more complicated than it was last time, because those were shovel-ready, already designed projects on the shelf that you were just waiting to do. Now it's going to be, how do we get everything designed and then ready for um, for investment on a, on a pretty rapid timeline? So, You're absolutely right. I think we're going to see it not only with engineering and design, but actual construction and potentially, you know, that may change the the makeup of the staffing model that we have in house too. And um, we're we're looking at a variety of different things as we look at the the public works department to to be specific. You know, what are the what are the operational needs that uh, may evolve? through this as well. So it's it's definitely a moving target. It's an interesting dynamic time. It's kind of exciting, kind of overwhelming. Um, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna get started on it and I think continue to be dynamic as we work through the next um, couple three years. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much, all of you, for your feedback. This is helpful. And Trustee Rio, hand it over to you if there's any other items. Okay, uh, Jordan, were there any, any, um, or actually, do we have any other business from anybody first? Seeing none. Um, Jordan, were there any public comments that were sent during our meeting? No, we did not receive any. I'm waiting to get one. After <laughs> I will let you know right away. A year, and a, year and a half of this. We haven't had one. <laughs> Next True. month we'll have plenty. I think, I think you got to wait till the numbers look really bad and then you'll probably, we'll probably get more. Than <laughs> yeah, that's what I'll, yeah. We're, yeah. Yeah. Let's, um, let's, let's hold off on that hope for a don't little Don't jinx while. us. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, all right. Well, if there's nothing else, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So move. Exactly. Roll call. Trustee, Vre- Trustee Vree? Yes. Trustee Hallwax? Yes. Trustee Rubin? Yes. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, Thank you.